Okay. So that's us up and recording. Um, so just to introduce myself again for those watching the recording, I'm Sean Mullery. I'm a lecturer in electronic engineering from IT Sligo. And this course is the Master of Engineering in Connected and Autonomous Vehicles. The subject we're looking at is a subject called Multiview Geometry and Computer Vision. Computer vision is a very, very large area. Uh, Multiview geometry is only one part of that, and we'll be we'll be touching on a lot of other areas as well. It's just that specifically in this area, the 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 idea of reconstructing three D views from uh, from images is a very important one, and therefore that's what we're we're mainly going to try and work towards throughout the course. That means we're going to have to cover a lot of basic material as well. Before uh, we get into too much detail, I've, I've left myself a, a free slide here to kind of make a little drawing for you. And uh, it goes something as follows, right? I'll kind of just draw a bit of a, a cloud like that, okay? Now, this is uh, what I'm going to refer to as the real world. You'll find by the way my drawings are not particularly good, but hopefully at least they'll be they'll be informative. So this is the real world, and the, the trouble with the real world is that it's very, very complex and chaotic and messy, and there's no way we can understand everything that goes on in it. it it's just not possible. From every butterfly that flaps its wings to every move that a, that a vehicle might make um, to all the different possible weather conditions and so on that we could have, we can never understand it all or be able to model it all. So what we do in general is we try to model this or take some sort of abstraction from it. So we try to model some small section of it um, and we make uh, a mathematical model from that, okay, which I've drawn as a perfect square, well, sorry, a perfect rectangle in this particular case. Um, because this is the thing with mathematical models, they're, 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 they tend to be perfect. And we'll just call it a maths model. Save myself some time and space. So mathematical models tend to be, they're perfect. And it, mathematicians themselves would refer to a lot of the things that they do as elegant is, is often the word they use because they, they want to pare it down to the absolute simplest thing that they can. They tend to use as few of variables as they can. So you'll, you'll see things like they'll, they'll start using Greek letters like alpha and beta and X and Y in order to try and bring this, bring some understanding of what's going on in the real world down to the fewest number of parameters that they can. Okay. Now, we think about maths as being complex and difficult, but in actual fact, in the majority of cases, what we're doing with a mathematical model is we're trying to simplify the world because the world is much more difficult than the mathematical model could ever describe. So even though you might find maths difficult, um, that's its, it's in sole purpose is to actually simplify things. OK, so even though it's a difficult language, maybe to understand it is a much simpler thing than than the entirety of the real world, which is, is not something that we can follow. Now, one of the important things about this is that we, we, we don't just need to understand the maths that's in the model. Obviously, that's part of the job we have to do, but we also have to understand what the mathematical model does not cover. So there's going to be some, some difference here between our maths model. Okay, there's going to be some difference there between our maths model and the real world. And these are the edge cases. These are the places where things don't work. So where our mathematical model does not cover all the crazy things that can happen. And it's generally in, in this space here where, um, you know, in terms of, of connected and autonomous vehicles, this is the space where somebody's going to get injured or harmed because our model or whatever we've built does not cover it. OK, so it's not good enough for us just to understand our model and for it to be perfect. We have to understand what the imperfections are that are outside that. Now, as well as that, while these mathematical models are perfect, um, are usually perfect, there's a difficulty for us because uh, the maths is just, you know, we can write it in some elegant fashion on a page of paper or, you know, maybe on a pad like this. But, but we can't actually implement that in a computer without turning it into a, a computer model. So from here, we go to something like this, which is a, a, a which I'll, I'll just call the computer model. OK, now, again, we'll use variables, you know, uh, generally speaking, in a computer model, depending on the programming language you use, you'll use variables. Uh, the convention generally in terms of computer science and so on is that you would use variable names that are descriptive. 
so that it's easy to understand. You don't see that in maths. You see things called, you know, alpha and beta, and you then have to find out somewhere else what, how they're defined. That's just the convention. It's always been the way. Uh, it'd be nice if it was a, li a little bit easier for us to, to make sense of at first glance. Computer programs generally are easier to make sense of at first glance, but they tend to take up an awful lot more space and, and are not what mathematicians would call elegant. Um, and they'll use different constructs like uh, for loops and... I see my 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 webcam uh, goes every now and then, so don't worry about that if it happens. Um, you know, we'll use things like for loops and if statements and all that sort of thing. And the the point here is that this computer model can never be as good as the mathematical model. It it always falls short, and in many in many cases, it falls a long way short of where a mathematical model is. So that is the second thing that we need to understand. We obviously we need to be able to write computer programs, but we need to understand what's the difference here as well between our computer model and the mathematics model. And obviously if it's if it's if the computer model is not as good as the maths the maths model, it's not going to be as good as the real world and therefore there's going to be a gap which goes all the way along here. Okay, so we have a gap. And as I say, this is the gap where problems happen. So Throughout what we're going to do in this module and in all the other modules you do, you are going to have to tackle some tough maths and you're going to have to try and understand that. But just as importantly, you're going to have to try and understand what that maths model doesn't cover. You're then going to have to try and implement things in a computer model. And again, that's going to be a struggle and it's going to be hard. But once again, it's not the only thing that we need to include. We need to also understand that there are things that our computer model cannot cover and that that there are these edge cases and so on and actually they, they, they tend to be not just edge cases they tend to be uh, happen quite significantly um so you need to keep that in mind so in everything that we do and there will be a lot of maths in this mo uh, this module uh, I, you know I'll, I'll be be straight up with you i'll do my best to give you an intuition for what each of the different things mean and 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 how to understand them uh, but you are going to have to tackle some some tough maths. But I want you to constantly think back to, well, okay, uh, even when I get the maths, what does it not cover? And then when we go to the computer model, how close is that to the maths model and what does it not cover? So that you can get an idea of where the gap is between that and what's actually going to happen in reality. Now, the trouble with that gap as well is that Donald Rumsfeld, you may have famously came up with this statement of the known knowns and the known unknowns. You may remember it was it was quite amusing at the time, but the unknown unknowns are always going to be a problem. They live in in that gap there, and um, we we need to think about it as much as we can so that we we try and find out what are those things that we don't know, um, and that's where testing of our system and looking at the safety uh, of it all comes into account. So there are lots of specifications and so on that people can follow. Um, you know, there are different standards and so on that people follow. I'm sure with, with um, Louise, you'll be going through standards like uh, uh, is it 26262 and so on. But don't don't just slavishly follow standards for the sake of it. That can often make you feel safe. You do also need to remember, just have a think about, well, where are the possible gaps here um, that, that, that could cause a problem and what do we not know, okay? So I'll regularly... Um, refer back to the very first slide that I showed you as I go through the as I go through the course in order to remind you that you know th there are problems this mathematical model doesn't cover everything the computer model and so on doesn't cover everything okay so we're going to start with some basic image processing tonight and you may well ask the question why are we looking at image processing is this not computer vision now some of you may think that image processing and computer vision are this you know, one and the same thing or they're all one homogeneous uh, group and others may be very clear on the separation between the two but one way or the other image processing is going to have to be covered as a first stage of computer vision and that's why we will be looking at it so while image processing is a large field in its own right it's generally considered a task that changes an image in some way for the sake of the human viewer and oftentimes computer vision is not for the human viewer. The computer vision uh, section is for a computer or a machine to make a decision. So in many cases, it's also the first stage of, a com of computer vision applications. And what happens in a situation where you have limited computational budget, such as in, uh, in, in an autonomous vehicle or even in a, in a vehicle that just has a lot of computer vision, you know, um, ADAS uh, features, there's... There's a limit on how much computation you can have. 
And that means that you can't have a separate image processing pipeline for every one of your computer vision um, algorithms that you want. In some, t some cases, you need to have one, one image processing pipeline that suits all of those computer vision, and that can be a compromise. So this has actually risen uh, a lot of the image processing to be a very important uh, thing because it affects everything downstream of it. So it's generally thought of as a pre-processing step, which modifies the image in such a way as to make it more suitable for computer analysis. Now, to start with this, we start with the simplest of them. Um, these are point operators and point processes. Uh, so and th they can be called either. And you'll see that there's a lot of things within this, uh, within this subject area that has multiple names. So the simplest of the image processing operators are the point operators. These, operators, uh, these are operators that manipulate or change each pixel in an image independently of the pixels that are around it. Now, the pixels around it are, are called the neighbors of the pixel. And over the next few um, weeks, I'll, we'll, we'll be detailing exactly what we mean by a neighbor and so on. Don't worry about it too much for the moment. But you can assume that in this particular case, we deal with one pixel at a time. As to how, uh, as to what we do, and examples of point operators would be things like adjusting the brightness, adjusting the contrast of an image, maybe correcting the color, and we use we, we use terms like correction rather than uh, enhancement because in many cases what we're saying is some problem has happened to the color and we're trying to get it back to what it should naturally look like. So sometimes we call these things corrections rather than enhancements. And color transforms is another one where we want to change from one color space to another. And again, I'll be mentioning those as we go. By the way, don't, don't, don't be afraid to interrupt me and ask questions as we go. Your, your comments won't appear on the screen uh, in the recording, but I can see them here on another screen. So if you have any questions, I generally uh, I, I keep an eye on it and I can see you, uh, see you typing. So I'll, uh, I'll wait for the question to come in. So if you do have any questions, don't be afraid to ask. Um, I've given the, the kind of extra time so that we can uh, go through this at a, at a reasonable pace. Now, an operator um, in image processing is a function which takes a pixel value and produces a new pixel value from that. So here's um, a mathematical description of it. And at, at first, um, if you're the sort that's a little bit, a little bit worried or afraid about uh, about maths, you might look at this and go, you, you know, there's lots of letters there, there's some arrows and so on. What 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 does it all mean? How am I to to make sense of this? So you need to think about these things as, you know, whenever you see the brackets here, this is very much similar to if you've done any computer programming at all, which I hope, hope you have. These are just the same as functions in computer programs. In a computer program, in a function, we, we pass in some parameters, it does some operation, and it returns some values to us. Now, if you've ever written uh, some large programs, what often happens is you, you'll write the function prototype first. So you'll, you'll write some sort of a, this is what the function will look like. We'll pass it this information. We'll get this information back. I haven't written the body of the function. I haven't told you exactly what the function does yet, but this will be the general form of it. And that's what we have here. So the first, uh, the first thing here to look at is f. And f is our current image. We've just called it f. That's what mathematicians do. If this was in a software, we'd probably call it image or image A or image B or something like that. But our input image, something like that, we give it a more meaningful name. But in maths, we have a tendency to just call it, uh, you know, some letter or otherwise. So it's a function. And what happens is that we pass it in this parameter. Now, uh, I was good in the first few sets of notes, uh, but I'll, you'll probably see that it'll trail off a little bit later. Uh, I haven't been so good at uh, separating things as vectors or matrices or otherwise and using the proper notation. But this this is uh, one notation for a vector. It has a little arrow on the top. Very useful if you're if you're if you're handwriting this stuff. So uh, this is a vector x, and that actually represents two values, an x and a y value. So we go a certain distance. Uh, over and a certain distance down or up, depending on, on how, how we deal with the situation. Okay, so X will contain both an X part and a Y part. Okay, so what we do is we say uh, there's some image here. We go over X and down Y some distance. We find the pixel that's there. We find what its brightness value is. And we return that. OK, so what will happen within within the, the brackets of the H here is that we will return a brightness value. Now, that then goes in as a parameter into the H function. So the H function is some operator. It does something to the brightness value. So it gets the brightness value 
And again, it has some function associated with it. We haven't de defined what, what that might be yet. It could be any of, of, of a load of different functions. But it'll make some change to that brightness value. And what it does then is it passes it over. Uh, it passes it over to this new image, which we've called G. And that in new image G, again, we've got, uh, we, we go for the exact same pixel as we went for before. So we go over X down Y in G. And um, at that point, what we do is we, we substitute in or assign it the new brightness value that we've calculated from our H function. Okay, so that's what we mean by, by this maths. And as you can see, I've talked for maybe two or three minutes about it there, but a mathematician can write that down in a very, very concise form. And it, and it has a very, um, you know, very clear message as to, as to how this, this function will work. OK, so we've one function inside a function, we make an operation on it and we pass it over to the other one. So usually for an image in the continuous domain, so rather than discrete, which most of our images are discrete, um, this X vector here would be what we say is in or two. So that's how you how you how you would word what's written there. X is in or two and or stands for the real numbers. So real numbers, if you're used to computer programming, they're, they're floating point numbers, so they can have a decimal, you know, uh, numbers to the, the right of the decimal place. And there's two of them. So we have, it's telling us that we've got two numbers, X and Y, uh, that are going to be our uh, two real numbers. Okay. Um, that's if it's a grayscale image. So if it's only gray in it, uh, if it's a color image, we generally have that in or three. So what happens is in, in a color image, we go over X, down Y, or up Y, whichever you want to say. And then we have a third uh, a, a third axis that we have to go up, which is the red, the green, or the blue. Which of those are we going to pick? Which of those are we going to operate on at a time? Because we can only operate maybe on one brightness value at a time. Okay? So that's the idea of, of the, 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 the way that the, this will be laid out in a mathematical form. When we deal with digital images, we normally move from or to Z. Now, Z is normally what we call the integers. Uh, and as you know, from digital images, we, we generally uh, can only have integer pixels across the way. So we might go from zero over to if it was a 100 by 100 um, pixel image. We might go uh, from zero to 99 across the way, zero to 99 down the way. Um, and in each one of those places, the brightness value can only take on a set of integer values. So if it's an 8-bit image, uh, it can only set on, uh, take on a set of up to 256 brightness values. That said, most of the literature, the textbooks, the the, uh, the papers that you will read, they'll just say or they won't bother saying Z. And I will do that as well from, from now on. And part of the reason they do that is for simplicity, but I think part of the reason as well is that they don't want to be confined to what happens in a particular digital image. They want to assume that this is continuous until the last minute at which point they have to put it into an actual computer and into a digital image. So this means that digital images are discrete or sampled images and each pixel has a location in a 2D plane. Um, so X is uh, X is a vector, uh, I, J, and we'd normally write that with a little T there for transpose because we'd normally write this as a vector with I and J there like that. Um, but I, I don't always stick to that. I'm, I'm I'm, I'm not a good mathematician from that point of view. Um, and therefore, our, our new image G would come from this information over here. Okay, so F and G are images. H is the pixel transformation that gets us from the image F over to the image G. Okay, and this is the kind of the, the mathematical notation that they use. So let's look at it at an example transformation. And it's this one here. Uh, so we can see that this is this is going to be our output image here, G. Um, we have our input image F, uh, which again is uh, parameterized, or you know, we, we, the parameters we put into it are some some uh, position in the image, um, and then we have an A and a B there. So the question is, what will this do? Okay. So what this will do is, firstly, the A here will multiply each pixel brightness by a value A. So we go into some position X into the image, so over X and down Y. And we get the brightness value that's there and we multiply it by some constant A. Now you might think if we multiply it by A, it must get brighter. 
But in actual fact, A could be a number that's smaller than 1. So it could be 0 0.5, in which case we would multiply it by half and we'd actually be making it darker. So that could be making it either brighter or darker. This does not specify, this, this equation does not specify whether we're making it brighter or darker. We can do both. Um, so that's the multiplication, but the plus B then, while B, um, the plus B simply adds a constant brightness value to B, and it'll add that same constant brightness to every different pixel. Um, so you'd often call, A would often be called a gain and B a bias. And you may also notice that um, this, uh, this here is the equation of a line that intersects, okay? So it's the equation of a line that intersects the y-axis at, uh, at, at some point. So you could graph this function against the input pixel brightness uh, brightness range and see what value of the output pixel brightness uh, the value will be. Okay, I can see Vin is asking a, a question there. So just uh, while he's asking, I'll, I'll, oh, he stopped. I hope it didn't frighten you away. Okay, so... Um, that's in fact what 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 I've done here. So uh, we've we've an image here uh, which is was from the launch of the course there about a, a week or two ago. And um, what I've deliberately done with this image is I've um, so Vin is asking would A be enhancement? It it may it may be enhancement or it might be correcting for something. So we'll, I'll actually mention that here in a second, and you can then decide yourself as to whether you would consider it enhancement or. Um, or that. Is bias an offset? Yes, just another term for an offset. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And we'll see that here in a moment. It'll, it'll be a little bit more definite. So, uh, rather than doing this in a computer program, I've done this in a, uh, I've done this in Photoshop so that I have a nice little graphical view of it to, to show you. Um, this, uh, this histogram here was done in Python, uh, but this is Photoshop here, and that's where I did my manipulation of this, okay? So I've started with an image here. I've deliberately made it a little bit dull to start off with. So you can see that I'm, I don't have perfect blacks or perfect whites in it and I haven't used it all. Could I just get an idea and give me a Y for yes or an N for no? You don't need to type a whole sentence. Uh, y if you, if you know a little bit about uh, histograms and N if you've never come across a histogram before. Okay, so, so we're getting mostly yeses, but a few ends, uh, enough for me to just spend a minute on it. So just to explain what a histogram does, this image, uh, and I can't remember what its resolution was, but let's imagine that it goes from 0 to 99 across the way and 0 to 99 down the way. Now, this this tends to be a bit of a convention with images that we tend to go down the way rather than up the way, but don't, don't worry, it, it could be the other way around. Don't, don't be too concerned on that, okay? And we've got all these little boxes. Uh, I'll maybe draw these with a, with a white. We've got all these little... Um, all these little pixels here across the way. And they have some brightness value associated with them. Now, what the histogram does is, because our brightness values can vary... In an 8-bit image, they would vary from 0, which is pure black, up to 255, which is pure white, okay? And um, what we want to do is we want to go throughout the image, and if this was, you know, this what we're showing here is, is 100 by 100, which is 10,000 in all. And I have a feeling I have far more pixels in it than 100 by 100, so that would, that would be uh, 10,000 in all. Um, uh, give me one second, Niall, and I'll answer that uh, that for you in a second. Um, so there, so there would be ten thousand pixels uh, in all in this. And what I want to know is, I want to know how many of those pixels are zero, how many of them are of are a brightness of one, how many are a brightness of two, right the way up to how many are a brightness of two hundred and fifty-five. Okay. Now to answer, uh, and that's that's what we show here. So this shows me how many are of each brightness value. So if we zoom in on this, we can see that we go from zero here up to 255 which is not we, we don't see any pixels there but it does actually go up to that value there okay so this is a recording and you can think of this a little bit like something like exam results how many students got zero how many students got one how many students got two right the way up to how many students got a hundred okay uh to go back to niall's question which is um I'm assuming, Niall, you're probably not from an electronic engineering background. Uh, you, you're from s some other background. Um, 
most of us use this almost without thinking. Yeah, no, that's 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 no problem. So generally speaking, in a digital system, uh, we count in binary and uh, in binary. Uh, so transistors and so on, they only they can only be one or zero. So um, to do that, we we work in uh, powers of two. So two to the sorry, just change that two to the power of eight is 256 and that would allow us 256 possibilities which is 0 to 255 and that is the size of a byte of information so 8 bits is the size of a byte of information who exactly decided that it should be 8 well again 8 is another power of 2 so it makes sense that that might be one it rather than 10 and um, so from those conventions on the way we have a tendency to work in things like 8 bits or 16 bits or 64 bits and things like that and so that's where that that number comes from 0 to 255 you might say, would 0 to 100 not work better? Well, firstly, it doesn't suit computers. Uh, there is a number closer to 100, like 127. But unfortunately, in terms of images, this is just a little bit too close to the fact that we could, that a human eye can actually see the difference between the jumps. Uh, whereas if we go from brightness value 0 to 255, the jumps in brightness between each separate uh, separate value is too small for the human eye to see. And therefore, that's why they went for, for 8 bits. So that's where that number comes from. Uh, but we do have larger images as well. We, we'll have images which might be 16 bit or otherwise. Now, what I've done uh, here is I have. I've done a bit of an offset here. So an offset or a bias, and I've decided on a bias of, of, of 20. So I've decided on a bias of 20. So that's my B. So B equals 20. And I've offset it up to there. The second thing that I've done is I've changed my value of A. Now the value of A in our particular case is to do with the slope. So this is the original slope here that we can see here. And so it has a particular slope and it's basically just a one for one slope. OK, um, but this, as you can see, is a slightly bigger slope than that. Now, I happen to know the values that I picked. I picked this value up here, which is 180. So if you want to know what the slope is here, it's quite easy. This is the zero point down here. So uh, my what, what we'll call my um, my run here over the entire thing, sorry, is 180. And uh, my my rise then is, sorry, I'll, I'll do it the other way. It's rise over run we normally do, isn't it? Um, my rise is 200 and not 255. It's 255 minus the 20 there. It's 235. Okay, so if you want to know what the, what the particular slope is here, the A that I've set, just divide one into the other there and you'll get the value of A there for that. I haven't, uh, I have a calculator here, so I'll just check it quickly. 235 divided by 180. And that comes out at just uh, 1.3, uh, 1.305. Okay, so if we wanted to write our, our, our thing here, we could just write it as that. We could write it as um, 1.305 multiplied by our, our image, f of x, plus 20. What effect... Why are they? I just, I just picked them that way. Um, Vin, I just, I just, I just picked some particular values for this this particular example. It's, it's, they're nothing special. And what I, what I do actually want you to do is to write some computer programs where you play around with these and and you get a sense for what they do. So what's happened here? You'll notice that in my histogram of my new image. Well, firstly, you can look at the image here, and you can see that the the top image here is a little bit dull. This image is a little bit brighter, but it's still it's it doesn't have some nice blacks in there, so it's 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 it wouldn't necessarily call it an enhancement yet. Um, you can see that my my bottom value, which was there, okay, so this is my my bottom value is there, has now moved up to here, and that's because it's basically moved by about a value of twenty. That's that's my offset has moved. The second thing is though, because of my increased slope. This top part has moved much further and we've also spread out the information. So there's there's less of a spread here than there is here in our image uh, brightness values. So the histogram actually tells us quite a, p quite a bit of information. And that's why any of you that haven't come across a histogram before, 
I'd like you to maybe go and look up some YouTube videos and things like that and try and get a, try and get a better sense of them because they'll pop up from time to time. They're very useful things, so I don't want them to be something that you every time you see them and go, oh, I haven't got a full understanding of that. Do spend a little bit of time. They're used in other in things other than images, but uh, that's that's where they're used a lot. So I'll leave it to yourselves to decide whether this is an enhancement or a correction for something. Um, and I'd also like you to maybe have a go at... Um, at maybe recreating some of these things in Python. So I'll maybe talk to you about that towards the end. Now, just to mention to you uh, that part of the problem with anything that we do in a digital sense is that you can see here, once I've hit my maximum here of 255, there is no 256 for me to go to, or 257 or 258. So I've run into a problem there. And that means that all of these pixels that are down here Okay, so I have a set of pixels down there. You can you can just about see them. They're fairly small, but there is a few of them there. Those pixels are all going to become saturated. They're all going to be set to the one value, the output value, which is 255. Okay. And in actual fact, what would generally happen in this is rather than us actually doing a mathematical calculation on all of our pixels, because we may well be dealing with more than 10,000 pixels. We could be dealing with a, me a million pixels. Rather than actually do this, um, what what is much more likely is we would do this calculation once for each of the different numbers between 0 and 255. We would set ourselves up with a, just a, a lookup table of values and say, if this, um, if this pixel value comes in, there, I'll show this in white actually, I think. If this pixel value here comes in, what pixel value comes out? OK, we'll just go to there and pick that value. And that's that's what a lot uh, a lot of the time in embedded software um, what we're doing is we're trying to make things easy on the microcontroller. We're trying to do things that that are easy for it. We do the hard work for it up front. So we do our mathematical models. We then do our computer approximation of that we then do all the calculations for it. And then we just get the computer to just make the quick jump between the two because that's better because it's going to be doing it billions of times. We only have to do our calculations once. OK, so a lot on that slide. Uh, I, I think I mentioned in the email as well that um, I will leave um, I'll, I'll export a version of this that's marked up so that you can uh, you can all have a look at that as well. So a word of warning, as I just mentioned, digital images have a minimum and a maximum brightness. The above may be a linear function. So that that, that was a linear function. Or strictly speaking, it's, it's called affine, but the, neither here nor there. But once the output reaches the maximum value allowed in the digital image, um, then it, it can't go any brighter. So this is important for two reasons. Firstly, we lose any information that hits the maximum value. So later computer vision algorithms may not be able to, to do anything with it. We've lost, it's gone, and we're not getting it back. There's no, no reversing of it. And that means the second thing, the operation is irreversible. So even though mathematically we can come up with a, rever uh, a reverse version of that operation, I have it written there as equation two, um, that will not result in the same thing if you've, if you've done this on a digital image and saved the result then that information is gone. So if you stayed within the range, this operation can be reversed, but if you didn't, um, then then you've lost that information. And it's worth your while when you play around with some of these uh, some of these functions, trying that, save the image, and then reuse it and reuse it, and you'll see that it degrades and degrades as it goes, okay? There's a second issue with regard to reversibility when it comes to using digital images, and it's this. Um, Operations are rarely perfectly reversible, even if the maths say that they should be. And it's not just the, the top ends of it, okay? We regularly end up with floating point values as a result. So you can see here that if I multiply something by um, a, a number by two or by 1.035 and then add 20 to it, I'm likely to end up with something point something something something, okay? It's going to be a real number, a floating point number. Now, the problem is my digital images are only permitted to hold integers between 0 and 255. So I'm going to have to round it up or round it down somewhere along the way. In doing that, I'm losing information every time I do. So every time you convert, you do a, you do a process on an image and you then convert it to digital, you've lost some more information and it will continue to degrade and degrade as we go. So pro tip here is that whenever you're doing any image processing, on uh, on an image don't change it back into a digital file and don't change it back into digital numbers until you've done all of your processing because if you do you lose 
precision at each point along the way. So it will be problematic for you and it will not be as good a result in the end. And you can even see, and you'll see this in some of the other examples, um, this this histogram here, there is one little gap there, and that's because I actually did some image processing on this before we before we started, and there's a telltale time, uh, uh, sign there. But you can see these big gaps um, in the middle here, okay? And those gaps are formed by the fact that we've had to round up and round down, and our um, the manipulation that we've done has naturally led to some uh, integer values happening more often than others. OK, um, so you will st you'll start to see that sort of thing happen and it'll happen more and more. You'll start to get these bigger and bigger gaps uh, between your 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 um, brightness values. And that will then show up to the human eye as well. As I say, the human eye can't see the difference if it's if it's a small enough brightness gap. But as those gaps be begin to come lar become larger, the human eye will see them. And of course, if you have any computer vision algorithm, it may start to miss subtle things that could be there. Now. Uh, previously, what I did was I multiplied by just a constant value, a number like A, and I added on a number like B. But there's no reason to suggest that I can't have another uh, a function called A. Okay, so I can have a function called A, and therefore the number that I multiply by depends on my position in the image. So I get my brightness value in the image here. but I decide my value of A based on where I am in the image. So I'm going to multiply different pixels at different positions in the image by different amounts. And I can add on a different amount depending on where I am in the image. Okay. Now again, we haven't defined exactly what, what this A function is going to look like. So we haven't defined where we are, you know, how, how we're going to deal with different pixels differently. We're just saying here that we can, and this opens up the world of, of possible things that we can do in order to manipulate an image. So both A and B are functions of X here, where X is, is this um, two vector, in other words, it has two positions in it, instead of just constant values, which means that the values vary depending on position. So what are the functions A and B? Well, they're not defined here, so, so they could be anything. So I want you to consider the, the, the possibility of a thing called a graduated filter. And I'm going to show you that as an example here. So once again, we've one, one of the images from, uh, from the launch. I'm cheating a bit here, and I'll explain to you how I cheated in a moment. But here's the, the start image. <coughs> now, what we can see here uh, fine is we can see the cars and we can see the ground here, no problem. But we've we've got no real information here in the sky. It's, it seems to be it seems to be gone. We, we, we can't tell anything about what the sky was like because the sky was too bright compared to the rest of the image. Now, you could also say that maybe the image was overexposed and we could have could have gotten away with a little bit darker of a ground here. That's certainly true. But then again, we've got a black car. And would we necessarily get all of the all of the detail there in the blacks of that? and the whites of this, the chances are that many image sensors will not be able to hold that full dynamic range of, of brightness values, okay? So, what we can do is this can be our function. Now, this, this function is just the A part rather than the B part, okay? So, it's just a function of X. And what we're basically saying is the top parts of the image, we're going to multiply that by a small number. Okay, so I'll uh, write it here. So small numbers here. And the bottom parts will multiply by larger numbers. Okay, so the idea here is these these uh, parts of the image uh, up the top, they're very bright. They're probably in the region of, ze of um, sorry, of maybe 230 up to 255. They're the very bright values. Whereas the numbers down the bottom there, there are particularly in the car here, those are gonna be numbers like, um, you know, down in the small numbers like, um, well, zero maybe, all the way up to about uh, about 50. Okay, so they're gonna be low numbers. So what we want to do is we want, to, we want to multiply the dark values by a large amount and multiply the bright values by a small amount so we equalize the image. And you can see the effect there that we've got We've recovered a lot of the information that was in the sky. We can now see what the sky looked like, whereas we had lost that previously. But what's the downside of this? Have a look at the uh, the salmon here. And if we look back at the original one, we can see a lot of the information about the, um, 
you can see a lot of the information in the scales here in the salmon. But if we go over here, that's gotten very dark there. It's very difficult to actually see the information that's in it. So we've lost it. OK, now the sky might look nice and this may look very pretty in an image. But what if we do this in an actual application where uh, we're using computer vision to try and see things? Well, firstly, if the sky is very bright, we may well want to darken it in some way. But there's no point recovering the sky because there's no, nothing we're going to crash into in the sky. But if this was a traffic light or something and we lost the information from it, that would be problematic. So generally speaking, what we're trying to do in computer vision is very different from what we're trying to do when it comes to uh, making a pleasing image for somebody to look at. Now, I mentioned that I cheated a little bit. And that's because this um, this photograph here was taken in a raw format. And the raw format is uh, it has more bits than uh, your ordinary 8-bit image. In fact, in this case, it has 2 to the 14, which... Um, Where's my X to Y? 2 to the 14. I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. It's uh, 16,000... 384 sorry, 84 possibilities possible brightness values the other thing as well is that it it extends a little bit so if we if we think about our histogram here as being um this range of values in in eight bits what would happen is we would have values that were were out here in the brighter area and out here in the darker area as well okay as well as whatever happens in here and what what I'm pr able to do by using something like a graduated filter is I'm, I'm able to take these pixel values and move them down into the range where they can be seen to add to those there. OK, so we can see that I've moved it to there. Um, but if you were to get this as an ordinary JPEG image or something like that or as an 8-bit image, at that stage, we've already lost that information that's up there. So there's no recovering it to look like the sky over here. Uh, even when we use a graduated filter, all that would happen is that we would end up with a darker a darker sky, but it would still look uniform and grey. It would be a lower value, but we wouldn't recover the information. So that can certainly be the case. And this is an example of what I, what I pointed out earlier, where with digital images, if we lose it, there's no getting it back. Okay, As it happened, I happened to not, not lose it. It was still in there in the information in the image. Um, but uh, that will not always be the case. So oftentimes you'll want to do these operations before you get too far into the system so that you can recover a lot of the information, okay? So the other thing that we can do is we can often combine two images together. So I've, I've given an example here of uh, image one, which we've called uh, F0, and image two, which we've called F1. Now, uh, Vin, here is an information. What format preserves more information? So uh, with regard to the number of bits and so on, um, the more bits you have, the more information you preserve. With regards to compression, if you compress an image, such as if you compress, a J, uh, compress in, in JPEG, all JPEG is concerned with is getting the minimum amount of data for your image that still looks like a good image for a human. So it's no, it's it's not really so good for computer vision. Now we still will sometimes use it in computer vision simply because we need to compress in some way. But JPEG was designed for uh, visualization by a human, and therefore it will remove information that uh, a human that it figures that a human eye will just not see or will be less sensitive to. So if you want to stick to formats that don't lose. Uh, bitmap will normally not, not lose and TIFF formats will not lo uh, lose any information and there are some other ones as well. Um, yes yes and no. Um, I mean, the, the, the thing is, uh, you, you can do some, some quite good, good computer vision on JPEG images and that's, that's perfectly fine. But in general, if, if you're doing anything with a scientific image and, and, uh, and, and you're worried about seeing things that, you know, see, seeing the maximum amount of information, then you you don't want to compress it. But by the same token, if you're talking about a, a connected vehicle or something, or, you know, you're, or you're trying to transfer image around the vehicle, you may find that in certain situations that the, that, uh, the compressed version is still able to see things. So, for example, um, if you think about the, the deep learning that we'll be looking at in the, in the module in, in machine learning, JPEG is still fine for being able to actually pick out 
individual uh, people and so on. So it's able to spot a pedestrian, no problem, because human vision is used to spotting pedestrians. So it'll still spot that sort of thing. But when you get down into the nitty gritty of the detail, it may not be able to do um, individual measurements and so on. So it really depends on what you're trying to do. And if you're trying to transfer images around a car to different subsystems and you're trying to transfer raw images, then you've got you've got a separate problem there. So it, it very much depends on, on the application and what it's going to do. OK. But it's something you need you, you need to, to keep in mind and be aware of. So Colin was asking, so low low light might only have 0 to 100. Again, it depends on the exposure of your camera. So it's not just down to the low light. It could be the exposure of your camera. So how wide open the aperture is, uh, what the sensitivity of your sensor is, uh, there's, and, and how long you, 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 you're able to expose the image for. So there's actually a lot goes into determining. But certainly if it's if it's dark, it'll be down in the in the in the low values. And if it's bright, it'll be up in, in, in the higher in the higher values up around the, the 200s and so on. But again, this is something that I'd like you to play around with so that you can get a good sense of it rather than just getting a, a very strict answer on it. OK, going back to the, the situation here. Um, what we can do is we can um, we can combine two images together by using a certain proportion of one image and the rest of the proportion of another image. And this is what's used in matting and compositing, where the alpha value here that we've shown is in the range of 0 to 1. So let's say if my alpha value was 0 0.3, then 1 minus 0 0.3 is obviously going to be 0 0.7. So what I do is I use... Uh, 0 0.7 of the brightness value of the pixel in the first image and I use 0 0.3 of the brightness value of the pixel in the second image and I put the two of them together so you, you can you can composite images in that way again that will have uses in computer vision as well uh, where we want to take to take things from two different places but it's 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 much more associated with with image processing where we're trying to make something look good for for um, for a human viewer but if you think about things like um Virt uh, not virtual, but augmented reality and so on, where we want to place something into the picture and make it look real, um, then then absolutely we have to use these sort of things. OK. So um, we're not making great progress through the slides. We're only on slide 15, but I think we'll take maybe a maybe a five or ten minute break, give you a little bit of a break there. I'll uh, I'll set this uh, set this uh, recording to finish and we'll start again maybe at about five past seven. OK.